If you have your Bibles tonight, you can turn to the book of uh, Galatians chapter 5. We're continuing our series on cultivating the right fruits in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, we are on number 9. We'll be finishing up next uh, Sunday evening uh, with temperance. And uh, we'll be done with this series. And uh, we had a few breaks there uh, with Thanksgiving there. And uh, that's okay. Uh, but we're going to be talking about meekness tonight as the next fruit uh, of the Spirit. Uh, let us look there in um, Galatians chapter 5. we we'll looking at verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no uh, law. Let us pray tonight. Father, we thank you for allowing us to see what you expect out of us. And Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we understand that these are things that are already at work in our hearts if we've trusted you. These are things that maybe some things are, need to be grown more than others at this present time in our life. Help us to see, uh, Lord, the need of each and every fruit to be able to have ample space to grow in our life. Uh, Lord, I pray, Father, that we would allow you to do the work that you've already begun in our heart at salvation. Uh, Lord, many times we don't possess these things because simply we stand in the way uh, of what you're trying to do in our life. Help us to move out of the way. Help us to allow you to cultivate these things uh, in our life. And we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We've been talking about the fact that God desires us all to be fruitful followers of Him. Uh, God wishes, His will is. How many of you remember John 15? What is the will of God? That we bear how much fruit? Much fruit. Uh, and He uh, lets it be known that He wants us to be fruitful followers, to be uh, Lord, doing what He would have us do. And when, when we trust Christ as our Savior, the Lord Jesus begins to work in our heart. He begins to cultivate these things. And these are things, again, and I, you know, by way of introduction, I know we've been going over this every week, but just kind of refresh your memory. We've been out of it for a few weeks. These are things uh, that don't have to be worked up by the Christian. It's not something we have to work ourselves up. If you've truly trusted Christ as your Savior, these things should be evident in your life. Now, let me take, a, take the brakes on there. Uh, and I understand none of us are perfect tonight. None of us have arrived. Uh, but the, the point is, these things ought to be working in our life in some level. Uh, I know that as you've gone through these fruits of the Spirit, there are probably some that need to be better than what they are. Maybe you need to love better than what you're doing. Maybe you need to have a little more joy. Maybe peace is something you need to work on. Maybe goodness, and, and we've been through all those. Maybe long-suffering, maybe uh, whatever it may be. It might be an area that we've touched on as we've gone through. Maybe it'd be next week at Temperance. Uh, maybe it's here tonight at Meekness. I know a lot of, I'd have to say this fruit that we're talking about is, is something that I, I know a lot of Christians struggle with, and that is being humble and uh, having humility. And uh, we are looking at that tonight in the fruit of meekness. We understand that these are things that the Lord grows and produces in our life. It is simply the product of Jesus living within. The Bible says to be saved is to be a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. If you're in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Uh, these are, I guess you would say the fruits of the Spirit is kind of a spiritual litmus test to tell whether you're in the faith. Uh, these are good things. And he even talks about the works of the flesh in the verses above and then he compares it with the works of the Spirit. And he kind of gives us this idea of this is what an unsaved person looks like and this is what a saved individual looks like. And so obviously, uh, if you have somebody who says they name the name of Christ but they do not bear any of these fruits, the Bible is very clear, especially in John 15, that individual is not even saved. And, uh, and so we look at the scriptures tonight and we see what a fruitful follower is. We understand uh, by looking at all these fruits that should be abounding and reproducing uh, in our life. We come to the fruit in verse 23 of meekness. And that is what we're talking about tonight. What does it mean to be meek? We see the word many times in scripture. Uh, it often is translated as the word gentleness. Uh, it's translated as the word humility. 
and humble, being humble. But let's look there. I put the definition up on the screen for you. The word meekness there, uh, it means to be gentle. It means to be mild. It means to be humble. It is a humble, non-threatening demeanor that derives from a position of strength and authority and is useful in calming others' anger. It is not a quality that is weak and passive. You know, a lot of people have this idea to be meek is to be weak. And that is not at all. Uh, the Bible, and we're going to see this a little later, Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. We know that. Uh, and so meekness is not a sign of weakness. Me meekness is a sign of godliness. Meekness is a sign that you are walking with the Lord. Meekness is a sign that you're truly saved. Humility is a sign of salvation. It is a fruit of salvation. It is controlled, I like this definition, it is controlled strength. It's the idea, and we're going to see this in Jesus pretty big uh, tonight, but it's the idea of someone who has strength but shows restraint. It's that idea of humility. Uh, this word conveys the idea of a listening ear to hear what God has to say. It is submission to God and unselfishness to our fellow men. It is the right attitude of self, not placing ourselves higher than any others, but understanding we are all on equal ground. There's nobody here tonight that's got a specially signed contract with God that says that you're better than anyone. Uh, this passage of Scripture, when it begins to mention meekness, that is the idea uh, that is being conveyed here. Uh, I, I kind of put this in my notes in layman's term. I'm sure you heard your mom and dad say this a few times as well as I've heard my mother and father say it many times. And uh, that, you know, in layman's term, the word meekness has the realization that you put your britches on the same way your neighbor does. How many of you ever heard that comment? Hey, they, they put their pants on the same way I do, you know? Uh, that's the idea being conveyed here uh, in the word uh, for meekness and humility. Well, we want to look tonight at the meekness exemplified in the life of Christ. And obviously, every, if you've noticed, every sermon in this series, I, I have really kept the same outline. Uh, I've given you the definition, and then I've showed it to you how this fruit was exemplified in the life of Christ. Because again, Jesus exemplified all these fruits. Again, the goal of a Christian is to become more like who? Jesus Christ. That's right. He is our example. He is our pattern. And if we want to know how to live our life the way God wants us to live it and be pleasing to God, then we look no further than the example of the life of Christ. Uh, Jesus is our example. He is our pattern. He is our blueprint. He is our mold that we look at. And so naturally, uh, we want to see this trait being exemplified in the life of Christ. And therein lies the answer to what happens to us at salvation. When we trust Christ as our Savior, Jesus walks in. And so it's only natural when Jesus walks in that we begin to act like Jesus. Amen? We begin to live like Jesus. No, we're not perfect like Jesus, but we begin to strive to live like Him, to say what He would say, to do what He would do, uh, and to, to, to just be like Jesus, uh, to be Christ-like, the Bible refers to it as. And so we see this trait is exemplified in the life of Christ. I think about the triumph, triumphal entry uh, in Jerusalem before Jesus was crucified there on Palm Sunday. Uh, the Bible in Zechariah and the Bible in Matthew 21 5 tells us that Jesus came in on a donkey and, and, and the Bible tells us in Matthew that he, it refers to Jesus as being meek and lowly. He's the king of kings and yet he rides into Jerusalem not in a trusty white steed. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And when the Bible sees this, it refers to Jesus as meek as humble, as gentle. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, of course, certainly was that. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 29, I do have that uh, on your screen there. Uh, in the Bible, Jesus just plainly tells us that He is this, He is humble, that He is meek. The Bible says in eleven twenty-eight, He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your soul. And so Jesus tells us that he was meek. He, he is humble. He is lowly. He is someone, really I think the idea here that Jesus is trying to convey to us in that particular verse is that Jesus is approachable. 
Uh, that you can come to Him with your problems. You don't have to worry about Jesus throwing His hand up in your face. And you don't have to worry about Jesus rejecting you when you come to Him and desire to lay your burdens down. Jesus is telling us He's humble. He, he will hear your plea even though He doesn't need you or me. Understand, God does not need us. Jesus does not need us. I mean, really, He could have allowed us to go to a devil's hell and been perfectly fair about it. But He loves us. And, 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 and part of the fact is, in His love, we see the meekness portrayed of Christ. He doesn't have to bear our burdens, but He's humble. He lowers Himself to take upon our burdens. I don't know too, now I understand kings bear the burden and the weight of the country, but my experience with kings and what I've heard and what I've read in history is they're pretty much pampered. Would you agree with that? We serve a king that is not pampered. We serve a king that is low. We serve a king that rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. We serve a king, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. I want to get ahead of myself, but I don't think that there's any more passage in, other than Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8 that really characterizes the humility and meekness of Christ more than Philippians chapter 2. The whole fact that Jesus came to this earth and the whole fact that he was willing to come and humble himself to do it shows us tonight that Jesus was meek. Look there in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 8. I got it on your screen. It says, let this mind be in you. Again, uh, the Bible is backing itself up. What we're reading here is a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Paul was telling the Philippians to, that this, this uh, attitude should be within us. If we are truly saved, this is an attitude that we should have. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So the king became a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men. He robed himself in flesh. And being found in fashion as a man, what does it say? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What an example we have in meekness when it comes to our Savior. What an example of humility we have of the God of all creation. The Bible tells us that he didn't look at himself. Again, he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He was the creator of the universe. He spoke and the world existed. I mean, this is a God that could speak and have anything he wanted at his fingertips. And yet the Bible says the God that had everything, the God that had it all... And, and really, there was no need of us. But because of His love, again, the Bible tells us of that great love. The Bible tells us that He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we see that, that, that meekness, that humility in Jesus to step down from the throne room of heaven and robe Himself in humble flesh to live upon this world. Mind you, He was God. He knew exactly what He was going to face. He knew exactly the poverty He would face. He knew exactly the trouble he would face. He knew exactly the mocking and the spitting and the beating. He knew about the cross and yet he still robed himself in flesh. Folks, think about that for a minute. How much does God love you? Absolutely. A lot. God loves us beyond measure. He doesn't, again, he doesn't need us, but he humbled himself. A, a God of immense power that if we were to sit here and talk about all His capabilities and His abilities, we would literally be here for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. You've heard me talk about uh, the service in Ohio one time. I was, I was talking to an individual and they dedicated an entire service to just tell people the names of God in Scripture. They stayed there over two hours and still had not accomplished what they had set out to do. May I tell you, we serve an amazing creator. We serve a great God. We serve a God who loved us enough to come down to, from His throne in heaven, robe Himself in, in, in this flesh, and live this life of poverty and suffering and anguish and agony because He loved us. He humbled Himself. What an example we have in Christ. And the Bible says we are to be like Christ. And so the Bible says we are to be humble like Christ. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is really telling us, that we are to be humble just like Jesus was humble. 
He is our example. He was the king of the universe, yet he was born in a humble stable. Think about that. God Almighty, he comes to earth. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, surely the king of kings is going to be born in a palace. I mean, many of the folks in Jesus' day kind of thought it was like that because they were stumbled at the idea that the Messiah could be born in a stable. That the Messiah could be born in a feeding trough, a manger. That really appalled the religious society of that day. It appalled them because they had this idea that the Son of God would be born in some kind of palace, that He would be born in some kind of golden trough, not some wooden, hay-filled, disease-ridden manger. But it just tells us that even though He was the King of Kings, He humbled Himself and was born in a stable. He was the King of the universe, yet... He lived a poor carpenter's life. He was the king of the universe, yet at times he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Now, if Jesus wanted to, help me out here, Jacob. If Jesus wanted to, all he had to say is, I want a five-star Hilton. And boom, it would have been there, right? Because surely if he said, let there be light, and light would be, I mean, the Bible says he didn't even have a place to lay his head. And Miss Donna, I'm kind of thinking that maybe I'd be like, give me a five-star Hilton. You know? I mean, he could have done that. But the Bible doesn't tell us he did that, does it? The Bible tells us that Jesus went about places and places where he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He was humble. He didn't go around flaunting who he was and He didn't go around flaunting what he could do. He didn't go around flaunting his authority. No. He was humble. He was meek. Teaching us an example. He was the king of the universe. Yet he died a wretched criminal's death on the cross. All because we had sinned and so that we could go free. He humbled himself so that you and I could go free. You see, the whole life of Jesus teaches us one thing. It wasn't about him. It was about us. The whole purpose of Calvary, the whole purpose of his earthly journey, the whole purpose of him coming and robing himself on flesh, why would he demote himself? The Bible says in Hebrews he was made what? A little lower than the who? The angels. Why? I mean, it's almost like he demoted himself. He demoted himself even though he was still the Son of God, even though he was God in the flesh. He demoted himself lower than the angels of glory. He humbled himself. Why did he do this? Why did he go through the trouble of Calvary? Why did he go through the anguish and the poverty and and the hardship of living this life and being mocked and being beat? being spat upon. Why did He do all these things? Because He loved us. He did it for us. He was our servant. Jesus became the God of the universe. Oh, He was King of kings and Lord of lords and at His snap of His finger, people can drop dead. But you never would have gotten that image out of the lowly Savior that walked this earth. Jesus did what he did because of others. Teaching us an example that we should follow in the same pattern of humility. I wonder tonight how many of us struggle with the sin of pride. You know, you can't catch a lot of Christians with drinking and and going down to the pool hall and the the bars. and you You can't really catch a lot of our Christians today Uh, on these big, what we call big and major sins. But you can nail a whole lot of us, including this old preacher right here, over the sin of pride. Amen? I believe that's one of the top sins of the church, folks. And Jesus made a whole point out of his entire life showing us the blessings of being humble. You see, because he was humble, we are blessed. 
Because He laid down His life, we are saved. We are on our way to heaven. So tonight as we look at this, we look at this as it was meekness as it was exemplified in the life of Christ. We know Jesus was humble. And we know that because Jesus is humble, He expects us to live and lead a humble life. Well, that leads me to my last point tonight and we're done. You all know what that point is. Meekness commanded. We've seen in all these Fruits, as we've gone through the Bible, we've seen where God has not only told us here in the fruit of the Spirit that we are to bear these fruits, but we see very clearly where the Bible tells us that it is a command that we possess these things in our life. It's not if we want to, it's we have to. This is God telling us we have to do it. Meekness is a command. And there were several verses that I could share, but for sake of time, I want to share just one tonight. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 is a very clear-cut, plain passage uh, of being commanded and being told by God to be humble. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Put on therefore as the elect of God. The elect of God. Who is that? That is the saved. That is those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. So basically he's saying, put this on because it's only natural if you're saved. Hey, he says, if you're saved... These things ought to be true about you. That's really what he's saying here. He says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, and then there's our word for this week, meekness and long-suffering. Isn't it amazing that many of those are a part of the fruits that we are to bear uh, that we've already studied about, but focusing in on that word meekness there, the Bible tells us, the Bible commands you and I to possess humility. To possess meekness. To possess gentleness. Matter of fact, the idea that is being conveyed by this verse is we are to be clothed with humility. I'm going to read a poem to you that I heard a preacher say several years ago about humility. He says, sometimes when you take it for granted that you got it all together, or when you feel like the prize winning pup, Follow these simple instructions. He said, take a bucket and fill it with water. Stick your arm in it and remove your arm from the water. And the hole that remains is the measure of how you are missed. Yes, you may splash and you may swirl your hand all in that bucket. But remove it again and you will see the measure of how you're missed. Clothe yourself in humility. Humility is something that we wear and we tuck in. We are to wear it around the house. We are to wear it around at work. We are to wear it at church. Although it's not the easiest to put on, it's the most rewarding. Best place to put it on is simply Calvary. Jesus wore it perfectly. Subject to His parents at twelve took upon him the form of a servant and became an obedient to death. He wore humility as though it were a royal robe to grace the shoulders of a king. That's my Jesus. That's Jesus tonight. I like what this author said. Humility is something that we wear and tuck in. The idea, you've heard me talk about being clothed because it just coincides. This idea of putting on in Scripture, coincides a lot with the fruit of the Spirit. And again, the idea is that of putting on a shirt or putting on clothing. It's that outward appearance. It's what people see. You know, when you put on the shirt, this is what people see all day long. And you've heard me say this several times during this series. It's that idea of wearing the Carolina outfit. When people see me walking down the road, they know I'm a Carolina fan. They identify me by what I have on. And the idea here is the idea of identification. We are to live in such a humble way that when people see us walking down the road that they automatically understand us to be humble. They automatically understand us to possess humility. Let me ask you a question. Do you possess humility? Do you think you're better than someone else? I've met a lot of Christians who think they're better than other people. 
I'll give you a good example. I've been in churches where someone comes in off the street and you would think that individual has a bubonic plague. I've heard Christian people. I've even heard leaders in past churches that I've served. What is he or what is she doing here? You know what that tells me? Well, you must think you're better than them. Is that a humble attitude? Yeah, sounds like self-righteousness. And that is the opposite of what God's going for, right? God says we are to live humbly. I'm reminded of what Jesus did when, when the woman who had had, what, five husbands and the one that she was living with was not even her husband. You remember that? Jesus didn't look at her and say, what are you doing here? Why are you in my presence? No, Jesus loved her and reached out to her and her soul was saved and changed that day. I'm reminded of the, de the demonic of Gadara. You remember him? Nobody wanted nothing to do with him. But Jesus did. Jesus took time out of his busy schedule to lead that man to the Lord, to save him, to secure his problem, to set him free. You see, Jesus was meek and low. He wasn't too big to mingle with us of earth. Matter of fact, now again, please understand me tonight, I am not demeaning the Godship and the deity of Jesus Christ. But Jesus walked this earth in such a way that people, when they saw him, actually thought he was one of us. Now again, I'm not trying to slam down on the deity of Christ because he was God in the flesh. But I'm trying to share with you the humility of Christ. And that is the humility that we are to possess in our life. To be clothed with meekness. To be clothed with humility. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not something that has to be mustered up. It is something that naturally occurs in the life of a believer. Now when I see individuals who say they are Christians and they, they walk uprightly, they walk self-righteously, they act as if they have arrived, it begins to make me question their salvation. Why do I question their salvation? Because God says in His Word that if you're truly saved, you're humble. Amen? It's a mark of Christianity. Humility. I don't know. I mean, this is a very uh, odd subject to talk about. But it's a fruit of the Spirit and God expects us to possess it. And I don't know if you struggle with it. Only you and the Lord know that. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart about some things tonight. Maybe there's some things that He's placed on your heart. Maybe He's trying to tell you something. Maybe He's trying to say, hey, it's about time you humble yourself. Understand who you really are in light of my word. You know what I am? Joel, I'm a dirty, rotten, no good for nothing sinner apart from the salvation work of Christ. I'm a pig farmer from Onslow County. There's nothing special about me. I was on my way to hell. Just like the sinner down the road who needs to come into church and give his life to the Lord. I'm just like him. I was in the same spot. You know what I heard a preacher say one time? He said the ground is level at the foot of the cross. He is so true. Let me tell you, there's nobody here that's got a special sign deal from God. We are all in the same line. And it's about high time that we act like it. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. With every head bowed, every eye closed tonight.